The Iron Mountain Iron Mine in Michigan has harvested more than 21 million tons of ore. Come and have a rocking good time with an underground tour and a loaded rock shop. Driving through Vulcan, on the southern end of Michigan's Upper Peninsula, it's hard to miss Big John. Big John is the world's largest miner. He is 40 feet high, 12 feet wide, and weighs 2,000 pounds. Big John stands above the Iron Mountain Iron Mine. Here there are train and walking tours from knowledgeable guides. Tours are available from June into October. Outside, you can take fun photos and check out John's wheelbarrow tire. Have a drink of mineral water from Old Faceful before you head in. Inside is the largest rock shop in Upper Michigan. The selection of rocks are extensive. You can also find clothing, gifts, and other great Uber items. Gear up in your raincoat and hard hat as you get ready to go through the mine. Now that you're a fellow miner, you can learn how they mined here for 68 years. Let's look at some of the highlights of the tour. So welcome to Iron Mountain Iron Mine. My name is Ryan. I'm going to be your tour guide for the next 40 to 45 minutes. So if you do happen to have questions along the way, you can ask at any time and I'll do the best of my ability to give you an answer, all right? So to start you off with, back in 1837, the state of Michigan would apply for statehood to become a state. What they're going to end up doing is they're going to send surveyors out here to these lands to section them off. And when they would arrive, they noticed there was a lot of storm damage. And during some of these storms, some trees had actually fallen over. Now they are noticing along the root area of the fallen trees were some type of shiny particle. So what they'd have to do back then is actually collect enough of those particles together and they'd have to send it all the way out to Washington to have them study. Now back then if you ever were to send out a state, you're not going to be waiting a few weeks to a few months. You're generally going to have to wait a few years because everything back then would move by wagon. So after many, many years passed, the results finally came back to them and it was stated they did indeed find a rich source of iron ore somewhere in this hill. So they had a, pretty much a little bit of an idea on where to begin their mining. Now this machine to your left hand side is called the underground loader that was invented in the early 1900s and it would be operated with compressed air. Anything that was to be hauled out of this mine before this machine was invented was done so by mules and by donkeys. So let me quickly show you how this one right here operates. So we have backwards. Forward. And then of course, up and down with the back. Now as of right now, there is a restrictor bar in this. And that prevents the bucket from raising all the way up. But what they do in those times, they actually blast the ore down from the ceilings and the tunnel walls and then drive this underground loader right to a pile of the ore. Then they're gonna use that bucket to scoop it up, it's gonna raise it all the way up and dump it right into the back of these dump carts. Now these dump carts are never gonna be designed to be perfectly balanced either. They're always designed to be counterbalanced. Why? so that one person could operate the machine, fill up one of the dump carts, come back out to the surface, and then dump it all on their own just like so. Now when this cart is empty like it is right now, the whole thing with the wheels included weigh about one time. When you fill it up all the way to the top with iron ore, it's gonna weigh closer to four times. So to kind of give you an understanding of what we're gonna be doing today, we're all gonna eventually march our way over to that other building where the train is gonna be. We're gonna hop on that train and we're gonna be riding in about 1100 feet till we get to the second Trader's Iron Formation. Once we get there, we're gonna hop off the train and walk the rest of the way on foot. And we are gonna be doing about a half a mile of walking, just so you know. And what we're checking out is two things. One known as the small stove and the other one known as the big stove. Now what exactly is a stoke? That is an English word meaning the large underground mined out cavity from deep inside the earth. 
from a small stove they'd actually mine out almost 4 million tons of iron ore and from the big stove they mine out even more than that at closer to 22 million tons. So we're all going to go down there today, take a look at those two stopes, and I'm also going to talk about some of the other things they were doing back in those times. Alright, so this mine was shut down in 1945. It started here in 1870, so it ran 75 years of operation. Now the reason why it shut down in 1945 is because that was shortly after World War II had ended. So that would mean demand for iron ore would not be as high as it used to be. So the price of iron ore actually fell from $40 a ton down to 20 a ton. So no longer making a profit here, had no other choice but to shut the doors forever in 1945. Now this machine right here is called the electric locomotive and this is in, to be introduced into this mine around 1920 as well as finally with electricity for operating it. Now keep in mind, electricity was invented in the late 1800s by the end of it, but when it came to the mining era, they would not see uh, technology like that until many, many years later. Now the great thing about this being it did run by electricity, that meant it had a lot more power to it. In turn, you could actually use this to haul out six loaded dump carts at a time, where for the longest stretch, the only use of the one with the underground loader. It have a similar cable like this one that would stretch the length of the ceiling throughout the mine wherever this machine was going to be in operation. Now once they turned that cable live, it was known to carry around 2200 volts of electricity through it. And it was pretty bare bones back then, meaning not covered up the greatest. So the last thing you'd ever want to do while working here and that cable was live is brush up against it or even grab a hold of it. Because if you did, it wouldn't be long after you'd be starting busting out with some dance moves. Now I'm not going to get into too many gory details, but you have to understand some of the people that worked down here had to deal with things of that nature. And I will have to mention about their injuries from time to time as well. But I'm pretty much going to wait till you're underground, that way you really have nowhere else to go. That was a Uber joke. <laughs> you're welcome. Now if you take a look at these two chunks here, this is called specular hematite. That is the richest source of ore they found in this entire mine and it has a 72% yield on it. Now back in those times, in order for them to actually profit from their ore, it's always going to have to be at least 50% in richness or higher. Anything less would not be able to be used because it just didn't have that kind of technology. Nowadays in mining, all they need is like 16 to 17% of it to make a profit. So what I'm pretty much saying is you're going to get underground today and you're going to see a lot of the remnants remaining from back in those times. We can't really do anything with it as in like mining it out. This is a historical landmark so by law we just keep it maintained year to year and that's about it. Okay. Now along the wall there you'll see some hand drills. Now they're not actually going to have compressed air here until the end of the 1800s into the start of the 1900 era. So what you're looking at was one of the first few ways they had of making progress. Now when you use hand drills such as these for drilling holes in a rock wall for planting sticks and dynamite, you are not going to be making any quick progress anytime soon. Now they did have one other way of drilling out those holes and I'm going to demonstrate how they did that later on underground. Just keep in mind, this style of drilling continued on for almost their first 30 years. Now this machine right here is a really nice addition to have. This is called an ore conveyor. This is here in around 1899. It was one of their first few machines that could be operated with compressed air. So that being said, what you're going to do is you're going to take this underground with you, proceed to line up a dump cart down to the higher end, switch the machine on, and it's going to start slowly spinning the belt along these top two rollers. From there, you're going to come back to this end, start lifting those chunks of iron ore up off the ground to about waist level, you set it on that belt, and finish the job of raising it up the rest of the way. You gotta understand a lot of times like that, it just saved a lot of their back work in the course of the day for them because before this was invented, they had to either maneuver by blasting apart with dynamite or they pick it apart with a pickaxe. And let me tell you, if you're gonna try to pick it apart with something like a pickaxe, not only is it gonna take you quite a bit of time, but also a lot of back strength and arm strength to do as well, okay? Now, this right here is our whistle, and it actually blasted three times a day to signify the changes of the work shifts. There was three alternating work shifts that would come work here throughout the day, eight hours apiece. They even worked here in the middle of winter time. Now, anytime anyone who lived around here ever heard this blasting from non-designated intervals, that would tell them something went wrong up at the mine. People from that town would actually come up here to see if they could help out. 
You lived in a town like that back then that pretty much always meant you had more family that had your back in case anything ever went wrong. And I'm not gonna lie to you, from time to time up here, things did go wrong. Now we did tone it down, but it is still fairly loud. This is what it sounds like as of right now. So not too, too loud, but then again, we can't really have it at full volume like it used to be back then. I'm sure the neighbors can agree with that, but if you wanna help make sure they're not taking a nap right now, give it a pull on your way by. Thank you. Good job, everyone. It's always best to let those neighbors know that you ain't nothing to mess with. Good stuff. <laughs> so speaking on that, if you do see a disgruntled older gentleman coming up the hill with a shotgun in his hands, one of you are the tour guide, okay? <laughs> All right. Now this right here is called a diamond drilling machine. Now they didn't actually have this until about 1881. If you remember me telling you, they started here in around 1870. Now let's say theoretically they would have had it from 1870 and beyond. And that would mean this entrance you see right there would actually be up over this hill over a thousand feet off in the woods in that direction. But because they didn't have it so much later on, they had to guess and they guessed wrong. Now it's going to take us a good three to four minutes to pass through this tunnel on that train. Back then, in order for them to even mine that out, that would take close to four years to do with hand drills and dynamite. Just keep that in mind as we pass through there. So what this machine does is do, uh, drill deep into the earth and it covers back things called a core sample. And these core samples can actually be taken and studied. And they'd be able to figure out by studying these of what was in the ground and how rich of the material it was, okay? This is how it runs. So you can go ahead and sit on, sit on the train. There should be enough room for everybody. And if the seats are not dry when you go to sit down, they will be after you do sit down. Yeah. <laughs> all right, all aboard, ready or not, here we come. <laughs> so that right there took almost four years to do with hand drills and dynamite. Now this wall directly over here is called footwall slate. That is nothing but soft rock and it has no iron ore in it whatsoever. So in other words, whenever the miners hit things of that nature, that would indicate to them they're traveling too far away from the bodies of ore. So what they're going to do is come back a bit and they're going to start heading west along the formations. So in just a moment, we're going to do the exact same thing. I just want you to know, the best way to truly know what they experienced back then is by partaking in it yourself. What does that mean? That means now that you're here, I'm going to need a ton of ore from all the adults and at least two tons from each one of the kids. <laughs> Let's get some work done, kids. <laughs> now, this mine here shut down in 1945 and it was sit abandoned for almost 11 years before being rediscovered. 
and it was rediscovered by a gentleman of the name of Eugene Carollo. Now at that time, Gene was in his early 30s. Fast forward to now, he's the age of 94. And he just turned so last week. All right, so they did not have compressed air here to the end of the 1800s. So in order for them to actually uh, mine here, they had to use those handles I talked about on the surface. They also had these rods down here. Let me show you. So one of the men would hold something like this called a star-shaped drill rod, and they're going to take this rod and hold it up against the wall. And while they held that there, two other miners with the hammer each are gonna take turns swinging those hammers alternating. This is what they're gonna do. First guy's gonna hit the end of the rod. Man holding that rod has to turn it about a quarter of a turn. Second guy's gonna hit it, keep turning it, keep hitting it till you have 13 holes in the mall four feet deep. In case you were wondering, that would take close to 10 hours to get one single blast zone done by hand. So when you take that long to do a blast zone, you surely are not making much progress through the mine. Hence the reason why it took so long to get from the entrance to the spot where we just hopped off the train. So that style of drilling continued on to about 1902. Around that time, there was a man named Frank Liner who had deep ties to the mining industry. He actually invented something that changed the whole scene of mining altogether. He invented this liner drill. Now this is the first drill they had that could be operated with compressed air. So that being said, you could do a lot more work with it in a much shorter period of time. You could actually get those blast zones done in less than an hour, where it took by hand to do almost in 10. Now, that big tall statue you've seen outside, that is a statue of Big John. Now Big John is actually based off a real person. He's not just made up like some people are led to believe. With all stories told throughout history of legends and myths and things of that nature, there is always a seed of truth to it in some way or another. But if I'm going to be entirely honest with you, Big John did not actually work in a mine like this. He actually worked and ended up passing away due to a collapse inside of a coal mine. And those kind of mines are way more dangerous than these ones just for the fact that it contains a much more brittle material. But as you'll notice, coming through here, you're not going to see really anything holding up the walls or stabilizing the ceiling. That's just how durable iron ore is, meaning it's not that soft of a rock. And it's going to take something like an earthquake to actually get this place to shift. Mostly. <laughs> now, you all are going to be leaving here today with the color of red ore on the bottom of your shoe. Don't worry, that was included in the emission charge. And if you happen to have white carpets at home, just consider it a gift that keeps on giving. <laughs> now what you're walking into is their first large deposit they discovered. Their first ore body. And this is where they actually mined out close to 4 million tons of iron ore. And as you can tell by looking around the area, there's still quite a bit of the remnants remaining. But what you're looking at is pretty much how they leave it when they shut this side of the mine down. Now I said this side because there's actually two. This side is called the Exploratory Tunnels and it was only intended to find the conglomerates or the ore bodies that we're in right now. Once they found them on this side and they mined out what they could, they shut this side of the mine down forever and then proceeded to work about a half a mile across US-2. And over there is where the elevator shaft is. Now this side here only goes down about 600 to 650 feet, where over there goes down 1,327. Alright, so let me light this stick of dynamite and see how fast she actually can move. No, just kidding. See this candle? Believe it or not, they did not have the invention of the carbide lantern until almost 1890. So what you've seen in my hand was the only source of light to see by for their first 20 years. Now, when you came to work here and you went to go start your shift, you actually had to purchase candles from the company store. By the time your shift was over, those candles would be nothing but tiny little nubs. Now, the only problem with using candles as a way to see is eventually you're going to have to start blasting dynamite as you work. And once you blast the dynamite, that would mean throughout the entire tunnel that we stand in, oxygen levels are going to begin to drop lower and lower. It's going to get so low, in fact, it's going to eventually extinguish your candles, and you're going to be left standing in the dark for quite some time. You're just going to have to be patient, wait it out. Eventually, due to an air shaft, which you might have already felt the presence of on your skin, that slight breeze, like was mentioned before, those oxygen levels would gradually come back, and you can relight your candles and get back to work. So really quickly now, I want to show you exactly what it was like with those miners in those times whenever they blasted dynamite down inside the mine. Now there are 
occasional things that grow in this mine because it is a wet environment. So there's things like moss, mold, even fungus that grow off in places. Now, I'm not really an expert on that kind of stuff with the mushrooms, but if you want to touch it and let me know what happens to you in a month, I surely would appreciate it. <laughs> this stuff right here you see dangling. So this right here is called a stopper drill. Believe it or not, what you're looking at was considered to be the most dangerous job in the entire mine. It was so dangerous, in fact, that the ones who operated this would actually nickname it Widowmaker. And let me tell you right now, that was very fitting to give it that nickname because if you were the one that had to operate this drill, chances are you didn't always stand the highest chance of coming back home after your shift. So why is this so dangerous? This is a vertical drill intended to go up into the ceiling. So what they do to start off with is take dynamite, blast up through there a few times so they had an opening big enough for one of those full grown adults to fit up into. Then they would actually eventually have a hole big enough they could fit up there, they get up there, press their back to the wall behind them, bend their knees and plant their feet to the one in front. And they'd hold themselves there wedged by their legs and their backs alone. So now that they're all positioned and they're not going to fall back out, someone from the ground is going to take this drill, fire it up, slowly hand it up the ceiling to them, and it was their job to grab a hold of this 80-pound drill in their arms that not only vibrated quite heavily, but also was very ungodly loud. And they'd have to continue with it upwards, knocking down loose or as they went. Now in those times, you surely weren't wearing these kind of helmets on your head. You actually had a helmet made from leather and cardboard to wear. You can see the design of those helmets on the Raptors by the whistle when we walk back to the gift shop. Now something like that on your head, anything bigger than the size of your fist falls loose and hits you on top of your helmet, you're going to feel it. It was quite common for things like concussions that happen with this, broken bones, and even from time to time, fatalities as well. Now I'm only bringing that up because I want to draw your attention to something. When you go to leave the gift shop today, be sure to look to your left out into the parking lot. You're going to notice a red pole sticking up out of the ground. And there's actually a combination of shovels, axes, and pickaxes stuck right into the side. Each one of those signifies a life loss for every one of those people. If you were to stand there and count them, you'd give them out 93 of them total. Now, I know that is quite a number, but if this was a coal mine, that number would easily be 20 to 30 times as many more. And that pole up there and us doing the tours down here is our way of honoring the spirits and keeping them sufficed. So when you all come down here to visit, there's certain things you don't have to worry about such as like strange, unexplainable whisperings off in the tunnels or seeing things quickly moving out of the corners of your eyes. Now, if you do, or, or you do want that kind of excitement, I implore you, meet me here at three o'clock in the morning. We'll come down with some cloak and shawls, light some black candles and get that magic board going. <laughs> and we'll get it done, all right? Now, if you ran that drill, that meant you had the highest paid wage in the entire mine at a whopping 17 cents an hour. Now welcome to the big stove. That means you stand 2,600 feet inside the hill. This is gonna be as far as we go, but before I start turning on the lights, I wanna direct your attention to that source of light across the way to the top. It's kinda of dim lit, but the sun really wasn't kicking out in force there. But that is sunlight you can see. That's actually the air shaft, and once it's constantly bringing down that draft, uh, breeze of air, a little draft of wind. And that air shaft is what led up to this place being rediscovered again 11 years after it shut down. Now if you keep looking across the way there, you're going to see a statue. Statue of Big John. Hey, look so big. <laughs> That's actually a 10 foot tall statue. It should tell you how far away it stands from us, which if you were to measure it out, it would be almost two football field lengths away. And it will take you a good 40 minutes to get those legs of yours going. To get from this side over to that statue is no joke. So why in the world would it take that long? Well, with no further ado, let me turn on the rest of these lights and show you exactly what it looks like when you mine close to 22 million tons of iron ore from the earth. Oh. 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 So if you want to get closer and take your pictures or whatnot, now's a good time to do so. Now, I know there's quite a bit to take in, folks, but just keep in mind, you're only seeing a piece of the ore body right now. To actually make you feel more comfortable, there's still a thousand feet of emptiness underneath the box. Now, if you were to look over there at the board there, over the top of the ore body is the observation point. That's where we stand right now. There's the Big John statue across the way. 
And then a half a mile across US 2 is the elevator shaft that runs down 1,327 feet. So to get a more honest equivalent comparison to how deep that really is, take something like the Empire State Building, drop it down this elevator shaft, and you're only going to see at most 20 feet of the flagpole poking up from the very top. And that is pretty deep over there. And there were a bunch of people that would work on these shafts back then. We're talking like 50 to 60 people per each one. Now number 13, that's where they're finding all that specular hematite. That rich, dense amount of iron ore, which ultimately meant jackpot for the companies. Now, like I said before, I'm gonna need that ton of ore, so welcome home, folks. There's your mountain of ore, there's your pickaxe. I'll see you in a month. I'll bring you a sandwich from time to time. Make me some money. <laughs> Now, there is other things inside this mine beyond just iron ore, like rose quartz, sandstone, jasper, pyrite, even soapstone. Now, we're almost back to the train, so that means you've officially walked about a half a mile through the mine. I tell you congratulations, but you haven't even covered 1% of it yet. There is, in theory, up to almost 15 miles connected to this place underground here. And some of, those, yeah, some of those tunnels actually branched back off to the city of Norway. So if you ever see in the news the whole city disappears into a sinkhole, just know that we're here. The train ride is a quarter mile long. The train ride itself is a little under five minutes. Ride up is as cool as the ride down. The tours last for about 45 minutes and offer one last chance to get a souvenir. Remember to like and subscribe.